The 12th century had nearly come to an end. It was the aftermath of the Third Crusade. Great kings of Europe had answered the call of holy war and went into the East. But was it worth it? Frederick Barbarossa had died in Asia Minor, and the massive army he led disintegrated in his wake. Philip Augustus called it quits shortly after the Great Siege of Acre. He returned to his French kingdom and renewed his war with the English. Then there was Richard I, who came within 12 miles of Jerusalem only to realize he would never be able to hold it. He turned back, leaving the holy city in the hands of his worthy adversary, the renowned Sultan Salah Adin. Inevitably, a new crusade would be called, but was the Christian world able to adequately respond? The Byzantine Empire had enjoyed its last golden age under the Comnenian Restoration, but was now falling apart fast. Its emerging dark age was made much worse by the Angelos dynasty that was now in charge, arguably the most inept in Eastern Roman history. The empire they ruled was fracturing at the seams. In what had once been imperial lands, kingdoms like the Bulgarian and the Hungarian had ascended, fiercely asserting their autonomy. The French, under Philip Augustus, were bitterly engaged in a war against their old rival, the English. To his credit, the French king would masterfully lead his men and win considerable territory, but he would have little time for anything else. The English would lose their champion, Richard the Lionheart, during a siege in 1199. A lucky crossbowman hit the king and a fatal infection would set in. Richard's brother John would inherit the English throne and his war with the French. But John was not the military mastermind that his brother was. In time, John's hold on northern France would collapse. Then his nobility and barons would rise up in a major civil war, culminating with his signature on the Magna Carta in 1215. He was, to say the least, too indisposed for crusading ventures. The Holy Roman Empire would do somewhat better. Frederick Barbarossa had united the empire as never before, allowing him to go east on crusade. He had left his son, Henry VI, in charge. Henry, like his father, found himself in command of an impressive military force, and also had his father's crusading zeal. In 1195, he declared a crusade of his own. He even managed to bully the Byzantine to give him a massive tribute to pay for it. But in 1197, the emperor died of fever in Messina. All of the preparations that he had made would come to naught. What would later be known as the German Crusade would disintegrate. And to make matters worse, back at home, Henry's heir, named Frederick, was only two years old. Thus, it wasn't long before the once powerful Holy Roman Empire would be torn apart in civil war. It would seem that most of the major powers of Europe were in no position to fight in the Holy Land. However, from this rather chaotic state of affairs, there would be one man who would be willing to take up the task of reclaiming the holy city. The papacy at this time was in the doldrums, ineffective and impotent under the almost forgettable pontificate of Celestine III. When he died in January of 1198, that would all change. Lothario Asenyi was a powerful and dynamic man. He was born into an aristocratic and wealthy family that spent well on his education. The young Lothario attended Paris University, arguably the best education in Europe, which was soon bolstered by a formal theological and law training at Bologna, again extremely prestigious. By 1190, he had shot up through the ranks to become a cardinal. And then, at the tender young age of 37, he was elected pope on January 8, 1198, literally the same day his predecessor died. It would have seemed that the Catholic Church was more than eager for a change, and that is precisely what they got. Now known as Innocent III, this new pope would bring a profound sense of drive, ambition, and vision. You know what? We need to go one up on that. This man wielded his papacy like a broadsword. The administration of the church was reorganized, in time, the Franciscan and Dominican orders were founded, 
and heresy was persecuted with a vengeance. The man really knew how to use his power. He would excommunicate kings and princes, strengthen the authority of Rome, and launched holy wars against enemies both foreign and domestic. But on the very top of his list was the recapture of Jerusalem, which became the passionate focus of his time in office. On August 15, 1198, the Fourth Crusade was formally declared. For the next few years, Innocent initiated a massive preaching campaign, sending his delegates throughout Europe. At one point, he wrote letters to various royalty and used a rhetorical device insulting them from an Islamic standpoint. Quote, Behold, we have now profaned your holy places, extended our hand to the objects of your desire, and have violently overrun and hold against your will those places in which you pretend your superstition began. Already we have weakened and shattered the lances of the Gauls. We have frustrated the efforts of the English. We have now, for a second time, held in check the might of the Germans. We have tamed the proud Spaniards. And although you took steps to rouse up all your powers against us, you have thus far scarcely made progress in any way. Where then is your God?" End quote. Innocent initially set the time of departure for his crusade to be March of 1199. But with the kings of Europe tied down by their own issues, and of course Richard I dying, Innocent came to the realization that he would not only need a new time frame, but also an entirely new group of crusaders. In late 1199 and early 1200, the call for crusade would be amplified. And in turn, his endeavor began to have an effect. On November 28, 1199, a grand tournament was held at the castle of Ecrae in northern France. It became a gathering of some of the most influential knights in Western Europe. Amongst all the elaborate display and pageantry, Theobald III, the Count of Champagne, stood up with his cousin Louis of Blois and brought the tournament to a halt. They made the announcement then and there for all to hear that they had taken up the cross and would go on Innocent's crusade. Now keep in mind, he was not just any ordinary noble. The young Count, just 20 years of age, had holy war in his blood. He was the nephew of Richard the Lionheart, grandson of Eleanor of Aquitaine. His father had gone east during the Second Crusade and his older brother in the Third. Theobald, the Count of Champagne, was the embodiment of crusading zeal. Indeed, he was appointed leader of the Fourth Crusade. Now, there is nothing so good for recruitment as having a celebrity, or at least the descendant of one, sign up. A tipping point had been reached. Knights and nobles throughout Western Europe began to heed the call. Amongst many nobles, there was Simon of Montfort, Rinald of Montmoray, and a bit later in February of 1200, Count Baldwin of Flanders, whose name, by the way, is worth remembering. He would provide one of the larger contingents. All of them would take up the cross. Now, all that was needed was to figure out what to do. Jerusalem was as before the main goal, but Richard the Lionheart during the Third Crusade had noted that taking Egypt would be first needed. It was, after all, the source of immense wealth, plenty of food, and without taking the Nile, the Holy Land would never be fully secured. Thus, the grand plan, and for the record, this was kept secret from the rank and file to assure compliance, was to board ship and sail to Egypt, secure Alexandria and Cairo, and then move up through the Sinai Peninsula to take the Holy City. Of course, this would bring up the next major question, which was who would provide transportation? Trade during this time period had rebounded to a level that surpassed the era of the Roman Empire. The Italian city-states had grown powerful and wealthy as a result. The competition between them was beyond fierce. The three main seafaring city-states were Genoa, Pisa, and Venice. Now of the three, Genoa and Pisa were actively fighting one another. They were at each other's throats. And they were also to some degree in the sphere of control of the Holy Roman Empire, which in turn wasn't exactly on great terms with the papacy. Venice, while technically part of the Byzantine Empire, held great autonomy and remained independent of German influence. 
By the end of the 12th century, the city boasted a population of 60,000, one of the biggest in Europe, and had become a force to be reckoned with. Therefore, it was here that the delegates of Pope Innocent III arrived in early 1201 to strike a deal. Doge Enrico Dandolo was nearly 90 years old and was blind by the end of the 12th century. There were rumors that he was blinded by the Byzantine Emperor Manuel I Komnenos during a visit to Constantinople in 1172. This rumor was most assuredly false. It was true, however, that the venerable Doge had no love for the Eastern Roman Empire. This may have had something to do with the Latin massacre of Venetians that occurred in 1182 in Constantinople. More on that in a bit. The ruler of Venice was an extremely keen man, with a preternatural instinct to business and expansion. Make no mistake, he wasn't just good at business, he was ruthless. Gunther of Pears, a Cistercian monk and chronicler, admired him, saying, quote, He was, to be sure, sightless of eye, but most perceptive of mind and compensated for physical blindness with a lively intellect, and best of all, foresight. In the case of matters that were unclear, the others always took every care to seek his advice, and they usually followed his lead in public affairs." End quote. Robert of Clary regarded Dandolo as a most worthy man. By helping out the Crusaders, he knew he could slingshot past his competition by securing hegemony over the lucrative trade routes of the Levant and Egypt. In a word, he was in but he also realized the extreme magnitude of risk that he would be subjecting not just his people, but also himself, too. Jonathan Phillips, in his book The Fourth Crusade, puts this really well. Quote, To transport the French crusaders to the Holy Land necessitated a level of commitment unprecedented in medieval commerce. The number of ships required would absorb almost the entire Venetian fleet and would entail the construction of many new ships as well. A modern comparison might entail a major international airline ceasing operations for a year to prepare its planes for one particular client and then to serve that client exclusively for a further period afterwards. As well as building the ships, the Venetians would also sail the fleet and participate in the expedition. Dandolo and his fellow citizens must have wanted the most watertight of guarantees that their labors would be rewarded in full. If the deal collapsed, then Venice faced ruin, and Dandolo himself would have to bear the enormous responsibility for that disaster." End quote. The agreement that was decided upon was for Venice to build and man enough ships to transport 4,500 horses, 4,500 knights, 9,000 squires, and 20,000 foot soldiers. Furthermore, Venice would contribute the sailors, captains, another 50 armed galleys, and enough rations for nine months. The payment was four silver marks per horse and two silver marks per man for a total of 85,000 marks. This was an enormous amount, equivalent to 60,000 pounds of sterling silver, or more than twice the annual revenue of the King of France. Now, part of the agreement was that Venice would get half the loot, either procured on land or on sea, not to mention any lucrative trade routes that would just happen to fall into their laps. This last point alone had the Doge panting in exuberance, dreaming of profit, and making him look past the insane amount of risk involved. But to quote the 62nd Ferengi rule of acquisition, the riskier the road, the greater the profit. So what could go wrong? An entire year would be needed for the intense labor, with the departure date set for June 29th, 1202, the feast day of St. Peter and Paul. Venice would keep true to its word, Phillips explains, quote, The heart of the Venetian shipbuilding industry was known as the arsenal. This was, and still is, located about 750 yards east of St. Mark's, in the adjacent Castello district. The number of ships required was immense. The crusaders were to travel on large sailing ships, often converted cargo carriers. 
The size of these vessels varied. The greatest, called World, and others such as Paradise and Pilgrim, had mass tall enough to reach the towers of Constantinople. To us, these ships would have appeared ugly and ungainly. They were short, rounded tubs. The horse ships, known as Tarida, probably carried about 30 animals. Each beast had to be suspended in a sling to prevent sudden movements of the ship, causing them to lose their footing and injure themselves. The animals were carried deep in the boat, with the main entrance falling below the waterline. When beached on shore and ready for battle, this door could be opened, and the horses, with their riders already fully mounted, could pour out of the ship and directly into the fray. This deployment would have given the invasion force an immediate and overwhelming tactical advantage. Based on these estimates, it was apparent that the Venetians needed to employ or at least provide at least 30,000 men to sail a fleet of the size proposed in the contract. Thousands of local mariners from the Adriatic shore must have come to join the crusade as the Venetians strove to fulfill their side of the bargain." End quote. Meanwhile, in the rest of Europe, nobles were making preparations to fulfill their crusading vows. However, the appointed leader of the Fourth Crusade, Theobald III, the Count of Champagne, became gravely ill and died on May 24, 1201. The remaining senior members met to decide on his replacement. After a long search, it was decided that Boniface, the Marquis of Montferrat, would be the new leader of the Fourth Crusade. Boniface was the brother of Conrad of Montferrat, the defender of Tyre, who would have been the next king in Jerusalem had he not been killed by the assassins in 1192. Boniface was considered a brilliant man. His family's legacy brought prestige and a sense of military experience. However, he was also Northern Italian with connections to the Holy Roman Empire. This would be a major source of contention for some of the Crusaders who were predominantly French and not that keen on following a mere Italian marquis into holy war. But despite this, the crusade pushed on, and in the spring of 1202, it was finally time for the Latins to come together in Venice. Knights from across Europe began to move towards northern Italy. The Venetians had prepared the island of St. Nicholas, now known as Lido, as a place to house them. The island was nothing more than a sandbar, but it was expertly picked by the Doge. It was close enough to keep an eye on the Crusaders, but far enough away to make an assault on the city unlikely. Leading members of the Crusade were now allowed to visit the city and gaze upon the armada that had been created. A contemporary record had the fleet at 40 ships, 62 galleys, and 100 transports. The Gesta Innocente would say, the Venetians had prepared a magnificent fleet, the like that had not been seen since long ago. Geoffrey of Vilhaduin, a chronicler of the Fourth Crusade, would comment, the fleet they had created was so fine and well equipped that no man in the whole of Christendom had ever seen one to surpass it. The Doge and his city had done their part, but it became readily apparent, even to the casual observer, that something was very wrong. Spring had become summer. The departure date of June 29th had come and gone. But by August, the headcount on the island of Lido wasn't 35,000, not even a half of that. Only 12,000 crusaders had arrived, a mere third of what was expected. There were unsettling reports coming in. Many who had taken up the cross decided to make their own way to the Holy Land. For some, like those who were coming in from England, it made practical sense. For others, they simply didn't like the leadership and bypassed Venice entirely. These contingents would later rally together in the Holy Land in Acre. However, for the Crusaders now essentially marooned on the small Venetian island, the situation was getting extremely tense. The Doge, sensing this growing calamity right in front of him, rounded up the leaders of the crusade and bluntly put it all out in the open. Quote, Lords, you have used this for ill, for as soon as your messengers made the bargain with me, I commanded through all my land that no traitor should go trading, but that all should help prepare this navy. They have waited ever since and have not made any money for a year and a half past. 
Instead, they have lost a great deal. Therefore, we wish, my men and I, that you should pay us the money you owe us. And if you do not do so, then know that you shall not depart from this island before we are paid." End quote. The crusade leadership dug deep to get the funds, but could only come up with about 35,000 marks, far short of the 85,000 that was needed. The situation had become a dangerous impasse. Meanwhile, Doge Dandolo was under tremendous pressure from his people to solve this. However, he came up with an offer they couldn't refuse. 165 miles as the crow flies from Venice is the city of Zara on the Dalmatian coast. The city had been resisting Venetian control for some time. It was now time to fix that. The Doge proposed that the fleet set sail and that they all capture the city together. The way he framed it was that the spoils of this enlightened attack would offset the money that was due. It seemed simple enough, right? Except for the details. One, the city was Christian. Two, it was under the jurisdiction of King Amico of Hungary. And three, Amico was, well, a crusader himself, having taken up the cross for holy war not that long ago. The proposal divided the crusade leadership. Initially, the whole endeavor was kept secret from the rank and file, again to assure compliance. But when the destination was made known, many crusaders simply withdrew from the expedition. However, to move things along on September 8, 1202, Doge Dandolo made the statement that he was going on crusade himself. Vilha Duin recounted the scene, quote, our men watched the Doge taking the cross with joy and deep emotion, greatly moved by the courage and wisdom shown." End quote. For the Crusaders who were dubious of Venetian motives, this was a persuasive move. Of course, the Doge had a political angle to all this. He wanted to assure his own people would go along. And it worked. Seeing the venerable man take up the cross inspired 20,000 Venetians, nearly twice the number of crusaders, to do likewise. With that, the plan was set, and in early October, in two contingents, the Venetian Armada set sail. Now, along the way, they stopped to collect tribute from cities that had been otherwise reticent to cough up the funds. It wasn't personal, it was just business. And then, on November 11th, 1202, the fleet arrived at Zara. The citizens of the city had closed the gates and had placed crosses in the windows to indicate that they were also Christians. An embassy was established on November 12th, where the defenders offered to surrender the city if their lives and their possessions were to be spared. The Doge responded by saying he needed time to talk with his associates, but there was great division in the Crusader ranks on what to do next. Many were against attacking fellow Christians, but the majority felt that attacking the city was a means to an end. On November 13, 1202, the siege engines were assembled with great efficiency, the Venetian navy began a blockade, and soldiers began to disembark. The siege itself was brutal, with crusaders either attempting to scale over the walls or to mine underneath them. The defenders put up a stout defense, but the crusader weight of numbers would eventually win out. On November 24th, the defenders of Zara, after weeks of fighting, had had enough. The city capitulated, and the sack began. After a frenzied looting, the spoils were divided up amongst the victors. Now, despite being allies, the situation in the city would remain very tense. A mere three days after its capture, a major fight broke out between the Venetians and the Crusaders. Phillips brings this encounter to life. Quote, An argument broke out between groups of Frenchmen and Venetians. Conflict soon ripped through the city. What began as a localized brawl became an all-out war. The streets ringing with the clash of swords, the whirring of crossbow bolts, and the cries of the angry, the wounded, and the dying. All through the night, the riot carried on till the combatants wore themselves out and finally calm prevailed. It was fortunate that the city itself was not burned to the ground." End quote. 
When Pope Innocent III heard of the attack against fellow Christians, he was appalled. He took the drastic measure of excommunicating everyone on the crusade. This was a harrowing prospect for the Latin Knights, especially the rank and file, many of whom had come for the best of intentions. Some were now keen for redemption, whereas many others decided to leave the crusade altogether. As 1202 came to an end, the crusaders and Venetians were accomplices in the fall of a fellow Christian city, a far cry from the vows of crusade. The future of their venture now seemed very uncertain and a bit dark. What would they do next? Fate at this time would intervene. The leader of the Fourth Crusade, Boniface of Montferrat, was not present during the siege of Zara. He had been at the court of Philip of Swabia and there had met a young Byzantine prince named Alexius, who was exiled and on the run. The prince knew of the Fourth Crusade, knew what kind of troubles they were having, and just happened to have an offer for them. This offer was initially kept quiet as it might have provided too much of a bad distraction. But now in the face of the Pope's excommunication and a crusade essentially stranded in Zara, all offers were given a new light. The young man promised to pay the crusaders the insane amount of 200,000 marks, along with provisions, men, and support for the capture of Jerusalem, if they would simply come back with him to Constantinople and put him on the throne that his uncle had usurped. It was too good of an offer to refuse. Thus, in the spring of 1203, the battled hardened crusade army and the Grand Armada of Venice changed its path and set sail for the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire. <laughs>